Hello, I want to welcome everyone to the Power of Our Story. Uh, my name is Sarah. I am the founder of the Power of Our Story Coffee and Conversation. And today we are doing this all uh, day veterans and first responder, um, what we're calling a storytelling jam session. So I'm so excited to be able to have uh, civilian writers and producers uh, who have just been touched by the suffering of our protectors. Um, they have taken years to write and produce their labor of love documentaries to give our veterans and first responders a voice and to really just tell them you are not alone and also to give hope of getting their lives back. And so the message there is hope. Um, I have been so personally touched by each one of these documentaries. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, share all of them. So we're going to have uh, Michael Geyer. Uh, he is the writer and producer of Wounded Heroes documentary. Um, we also have Ryan Mayers and Matthew Mayers, uh, who wrote and produced Walk with Frank documentary. And then we also have Mark Stafford and Brian Morrison, who wrote uh, and produced Bastards Road documentary. And they, all three of these, hit a different angle in the veteran and first responder experience again all the each of these i was so moved by so it's an incredible honor to have you all here so welcome thank you thank you sarah it's a pleasure to be here it's really an honor so tell us about you two and your movie because i am uh... okay so um our <laughs> movie uh so i'm ryan and this is my brother matt hello and our movie is about a frank romeo and Frank is a Vietnam veteran who on his 70th birthday, he decided uh, the way he wanted to celebrate was walking across New York state to meet homeless veterans, advocate for veterans with PTSD and other survivors of PTSD. And along the way, you know, kind of coming to terms with his own uh, darkness, you know, the, his own demons and um, which he's been working through for the last 50 years. Mm. Uh, Frank, for 30 years, he has been uh, teaching about PTSD and um, taking uh, his, he has artwork that he's painted uh, kind of as part of his therapy, as part of his recovery. And he also takes reproductions from the National Vietnam, uh, it's, it's called the National Veterans Art Museum in Chicago. He takes reproductions from there on the road and he calls it the art of war. And he speaks mm. to uh, to high school students and basically anyone who will listen to him. He's been doing this for about 30 years. And this, this walk for him was the culmination of all of that. Frank's whole process in building this whole educational curriculum that he's been pushing all these years, um, it all came from traveling. You know, when Frank sort of discovered artwork, he, it was his own first, then he discovered that there's other veterans out there painting. And, no programs to support this. So he really got in his van and took his artwork around the country, just finding people that would look and listen and talk. And by doing that, he made connections with people around the country, um, found other artists looking to share their work, you know, eventually submitted also to the art museum and, and their stuff's now, you know, um, exhibited there. Um, this ended up, you know, he realized that this was part of, this was helping him heal. And he realized that just that part of traveling, moving forward, seeing himself, you know, he always says, if he sees the world moving past him, he knows he's not stuck in place. He knows he's moving mm. forward, you know? And part of that PTSD for him was that feeling isolated, stuck in place, cannot, literally can't move, frozen, you know? He tells a story where he saw his friends at a diner and wanted to go see them and literally couldn't, just could not take that step. Mm. So he uses that as a metaphor. And, you know, this led to him eventually going back to Vietnam, doing the same thing, you know, creating an educational curriculum around him, discovering it on his own. So he would Skype in students um, in Bay Shore while he was journeying through Vietnam, revisiting all the places that he was back when he was serving there. And um, part of seeing that country, the whole, all this whole society had moved on and he was still stuck in place, really helped him again, just move forward even more. And, you know, he just felt like this reality-based way of teaching about, um, the history of our soldiers, not, not just the history of the war, but the history of our soldiers um, and how it's so similar dating back all the way to the Civil War. It just, it seemed to work. So all that really led up. It's a layered thing, but it really all led up to him doing this walk, pushing the educational programs, why he focused on New York State um, and just walking and doing the same thing that he's always been doing, which is just moving forward, seeing the world move past him and connecting with others, trying to share the message. 
so the movie follows his journey across the state and also tells the story of his life and how PTSD mm. affected him and his family. That's great. How about you, Michael? Um, so yeah, my film is Wounded Heroes and I didn't plan on making this film originally. I was going to be producing another film with you know actors. We had a screenplay, uh, just a regular theatrical film. Um, and I didn't know much about post-traumatic stress, which was one. There was one of the. It was one of the storylines. Post-traumatic stress in this film, and so I wanted to interview veterans and military brass and just try to figure out exactly what is post-traumatic stress, what's working, what's not. And I met a guy in San Diego doing doing one of these interviews named Carl, and he was on at the time they had just lowered it from 18 medications down to 16. But still, I'm blown away. I'm like, how is it possible? You're in your late 20s and you're taking 16 medications, some of them two or three times a day. So he's popping 30, 40 pills every day. And he said it wasn't helping. He said it was just a Band-Aid that pushed back the symptoms, but that it didn't actually solve the problem. So when I walked out of that interview, I thought, man, I got to put this movie on hold and we got to do a documentary and see if we can figure out if there are better options out there for people battling post-traumatic stress so that they don't have Band-Aids anymore, but we find something that actually gets rid of the post-traumatic stress, gives them their lives back. And I didn't know if that existed, um, but it ended up being a three-year journey, doing a lot of research the first year, finding great treatment options and programs, and then setting up uh, the interviews, which we did all over the country with different people. And then the last third year, of course, was uh, the editing, which was a very long process, as you all know. <laughs> editing is not an easy task. It's a, it's a big, uh, big, big deal when you try to get a film like that done. But anyway, so we got it released, and um, we, I produced it literally as a passion project to give back as a thank you to our veterans and first responders and anybody battling post-traumatic stress. Uh, and the film does feature amazing treatments and programs that are changing lives. And we're getting lots of emails and social media posts from people saying it's changed our lives. When we've done in-person screenings, we've got people in tears thanking us for making the film. And so that was our goal, make this thing, um, release it so that it saves and changes lives. And it has. And that was my journey as far as why. And uh, we released it in March and it's playing all over the world. So it's pretty fun. That's amazing. That really is. I, I saw the film. It's really fantastic. And uh you know, the, the treatments that, that you're offering or that you're talking about, I've never heard of any of them. Mm -hmm. It's really amazing to, to see. It's also interesting because, you know, just it goes, it's just in line of what we found in, with the Walk with Frank was that, you know, there's, there is no tailored treatment. You know, that's yeah. one of the problems right now is that they try to tailor a treatment and everyone is dealing with it in such different ways and, and, um, and the, you know, can be affected in such, by, by treatments in such different ways. And it's hard to know. And, and as you know. talked about, um frank being isolated you know and trying to fight that battle alone and that's one of the things that we found and that we included in the film that you know when you're out in battle you have each other's back you know when you need cover you know reinforcements you call in you know you get your reinforcements and you know you've got each other's back and you take out the enemy and in this case it's we've got the enemy of post-traumatic stress but for some reason when they get home they don't want to talk about it they want to isolate and so we're trying to really encourage people that like when you're overseas and you're in battle, fight the fight together. You know, uh, it's, it's so important. And there are ways to do that. And they understand each other. I'm a civilian. Well, you guys are civilians. We don't understand. We haven't experienced it firsthand. So for them to put themselves in amongst a group that does understand and they are not fighting it alone any longer and they have each other's back and they can check on on each other, you know, week after week, month after month, year after year, that is so important for recovery. I agree. The connection part of it was one of the biggest aspects that we took away from this. I mean, mm -hmm. how, how it helped Frank, how we saw him rebuild his family over the years. We've gotten to know all of them really, really well. They've become family to us too. And it's, it's amazing after what they've been through. And, you know, even just screening the film, they, they talk about having gone through so much, just watching these things, reliving these things and mm -hmm. you know, seeing these things, uh, these emotions that, you know, the, that the film brings up and, uh, you know, like you said, it's like we haven't experienced it and we, we sort of feel like, you know, <sighs> what's the word, you know, undeserving of the trust, you know, mm. him coming into doing this with Frank and, you know, he, he's the way he is. He's so open and honest. And, you know, yeah. I think seeing him inspiring others with that honesty to also be open and honest 
Um, I think it rubbed off on us and everyone that was part of the ground crew and everyone involved. And I think for us, you know, on a, on a larger scale, that that connection is about as a civilian, you know, opening yourself up to what, you know, a conversation with a veteran that you might have where, you know, I think that's the biggest uh, gap that we need to divide is, is just that, uh, you know, as civilians, not just thank you for your service and sort of ending it there, which is one of the things that a lot of people discussed in the film and it didn't quite make it in as much as we wanted to that sort of concept of it. But everyone we talked to talks about that, you know, seeing that, you know, I support my troops on their bumper sticker and, you know, it ends there, it ends at that bumper sticker. Yeah. So, you know, it's sort of, and, it, and where I originally, I think both of us originally found it really hard. And like I said, that undeserved trust was like to listen to these people opening up to us. Mm -hmm. Then we started to feel like this is exactly what needs to happen. You know, people like us need to hear these stories and listen and tell others that it's okay to ask these questions and hear these stories. And, and I think that's, that's a big step to, to, to these people healing, to everybody yeah. healing. And it was so brave of Frank to do that, to open up and be vulnerable because he's helping so many because of uh, the fact that he is being so open. And that's one of the reasons he wanted to do the walk initially was because, you know, I mean, we live in a society where everyone's on their phones and everybody's, you know, tends to be a little bit isolated when you're a combat veteran it even takes it to another level where you know a lot of these uh, combat veterans don't want to talk to anybody especially someone that 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 doesn't really understand so frank's concept when he did the walk was i, I want to get out there i want to meet people i want to talk to people i want to kind of have conversations and just be open uh one of his initial uh kind of uh, you know concepts was i'm going to talk about my my PTSD. I'm going to admit that I have a problem mm. and I'm not going to be ashamed about it. And I think, I mean, it was he really says it before every speech he gives. Mm. He says, Frank Romeo and I have mental illness is how he puts it. And, you know, he wants people to know that it's, you know, if it's okay to get up there and talk, then, then someone else is going to, and it, ha and it happens all the time. And we, for, saw, we saw it happen. People get up there and say, I've not ever said this before. And for us, I mean, we saw people open up and it wasn't opening up to us per se, it was opening up to Frank. And part of the reason that they opened up is because of his honesty. So it was really kind of- a... But we felt it gave us a responsibility. I mean, oh, we, sure. we just felt yeah. responsible, not just to every single person that wanted to open up to us, but mostly to Frank to really honor his story because it's truly amazing. Yeah. What he's been through and what he's, you know, overcome is, is amazing. And it, may, and it makes us look at things different and, you know, the, the little amounts of adversity that we face and, you know. And, and, to, and to, you know, work through it, I mean, it's not like he's healed and he never talks about being healed. It's, it's, he talks about PTSD as something that you're always going to deal with. And, you know, and then and to, everyone's and different. To, but. And to go even larger than PTSD, just mental illness in general. I mean, once, once you start going down that road, you realize like we all know someone, we all have someone, we all deal with issues, you know, levels of, of, of issues ourselves. And if it's like, if we admit it to ourselves and we embrace it the way that Frank does, you know, it's a step towards us making ourselves better. And I think that's just the best thing. And where's the other film? The um... oh, Mark is right here. Yes. Uh, hey, sorry, guys. Uh, we Mark, good to see you. Oh, and there you are. Your film's Mark. amazing too, Mark. I'd love to hear, you know, about about uh, you know Bastards Road and how you came to that. Yeah. Uh, first, let me. Yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, we've had crazy storms all day, and our power's been in and out. Uh, mm. So that's why I dropped off there for a little bit. Um, but um, yeah, I mean. Um, you know, it, it, I hear so many similarities, you know, um, how it came about uh, w was, you know, a little bit of an accident, really. I mean, so Brian, who unfortunately couldn't join us today, um, had something come at the last minute, but Brian came across John's story on, on uh, Facebook originally, actually. Um, unknowingly, they had some connections. Um, and what he found out later is they actually went to the same high school were, were only a year apart, but they didn't know each other because they ran in different crowds. Mm -hmm. um, but they had a connection on Facebook. So he had seen John's story. John had, had started his walk and had been posting occasionally to friends to kind of let them know how he was doing and, and, and how he was processing what he was doing. Um, <clears throat> And Brian was really fascinated by it. And he uh, kind of just took a risk and reached out to him. And, um, you know, they had like a really long talk. And, and John, John, you know, he was not looking to do this at all. Like he was not looking to bring a couple strangers into his life and start 
exposing what he was going through and kind of like on screen processing his life and everything that he's been through. Um, but that, you know, they had some kind of uh, trust connection that, that happens once in a while in life. And um, John slept on it that night and he called Brian back the next day and he's like, all right, well, let's, let's at least sit down and talk and give it a shot, right? Um, <clears throat> and, you know, it was right then that Brian told me about it, kind of came out of the blue and um, we were both drawn to the story immediately. Um, just because we you know, were like, why is he doing this? Um, and, you know, um, once we got to know John a little bit, the, the game, it was already, it was game over because John is like this big personality, just gregarious and outgoing and like infectious. And he's kind of a, he's kind of a unicorn in a lot of ways because he's kind of like, um, I always joke with him and others that shared with him that he's like a half Marine, half hippie. Cause he kind of is, <laughs> he kind of is like, he, he just, he's always kind of like stepping back and trying to look at things in different ways and stuff. And, you know, you see that a lot in the film um, <clears throat> because that's just what he does. He's, he's, he tends to just kind of put things out there and uh, let the world, you know, deal with them. And, um, you know, <clears throat> and when Brian started visiting John on his walk for, you know, three, four days at a time, once a month or whatever it was. And we did that for the next year or so. Um, you know, and Brian would be feeding me the foot, you know, uh, Brian would be feeding me the footage back and, um, you know, started developing what the story could be. And, you know, like you guys mentioned earlier, I mean, that process took years. Uh, you know, we were both working full time and, um, you know, uh, we always wanted to make a film together, but you know, how this one came about was a little bit, we just got lucky to be honest with you, you know, like um, you can, you can have a great story. Uh, you can have a really cool subject. You can have all these other things, but if you, if, you know, we got lucky in getting this person that was an incredible vessel. Um, and, you know, once he realized he's like, he asked himself, honestly, he's like, okay, so if you really want to help others, why wouldn't you do this? Why wouldn't you be this voice or try to be this voice? And when he really honestly asked himself that, that's why he decided to kind of be, you know, try to open himself up a little, which I still consider a miracle because mm. if I'm him, why the hell do I trust me or Brian? Why? Mm. I mean, um, you know, so, um, yeah, I mean, I, I just feel incredibly blessed, honestly, because uh, my life would have never crossed paths with John. Um, or any of those he served with, or any of the Gold Star families, or Blue Star families, or any of them. Um, it just wouldn't have, you know, it just, you know, um, I don't naturally run in those circles. So, I mean, you know, my life changed because a human being taught me about their world. Um, and it's, you know, you can't unlearn it. You can't, you can't not be affected by it for the rest of your life. <clears throat> Yeah, I don't, I don't so, think you could have put that any better. I mean, yeah, it's so true and so powerful to hear that because we had a really similar, you can't unlearn it. And yeah. it's, it's like, it's just embedded in there. And it's like, we've tried to tell people along the way, you know, what we were experiencing. And it was sort of hard to, you know, communicate. Like this guy's got these stories and it's like, you know, even when the cameras are off, he would just be going on and on. It like never stopped. It's like you said, it's, it's, you're lucky. You feel lucky as a filmmaker to have this vessel that's willing to, to just be as honest as they possibly can. Now, Frank was a little more willing. Well, because I think he came into this, I mean, again, because he's been yeah. doing this for so long and it was the culmination of something for him. Mm -hmm. so for him, it was like, you know, and he's really artistic, he's an artist. So, which was even better to have someone, you know, to be able to give his artistic value to, which, you know, ended up being, you know, just incredibly valuable. But, then, um, but it, it was very much like, you know, put the camera here, you gotta <laughs> shoot this, you gotta, we, we gotta make sure we do this, we gotta. <laughs> You know, how are you guys going to do this? What's going to go here? Like, you know. And every time um, he filmed himself, he was bringing his camera, his phone to film people's stories along the way and posting it. Oh, that's great. Which, again, was part of his whole history of documenting. He did it through Vietnam. He, he documented everything through blog and through selfies, you know, and Skyping. So in doing that, we wanted to incorporate that idea of his self-documentation because to him, that's part of how he heals. It's way him sharing, you know, I'm alone on the road, but I can put a camera up and share it with my my viewers out there, my followers. So to us, that was such an important, you know, 
uh, part of who Frank is and how he tells his stories. So we wanted to incorporate it in the film. There were times because of the shooting schedule and because you know the low budget nature of it, Matt would be, you know, he would meet Frank and Oniata and, and they would oh, yeah. say, you know, and, and then and then he'd call me and be like, Oh my god, Frank told me this story, you'll never believe. And like so you know, we learned about Frank, you know, over the months of filming on the walk and you know, getting to know him. He opened up to us and telling us like stories about his life that we but at the same time, and I'm, and I'm curious how you guys approached it because there, it was, you know, trying to weed out the stuff that's sort of, you know, you want to engage your audience and, you know, you know how long you want to make it. I mean, we started over closer to two hours. We're over like uh, now, 15 hours. Our, our first cut was three hours. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> because not that we ever intended it to look. I mean, our goal was always an hour and a half. But, um, you know, because we knew, like, I mean, just, you know, that. Uh, I do work with festivals and stuff like that. They don't, that, that's just, <laughs> that's where their brain set is at, right? Um, so, um, but we knew we, we actually took that first cut and went down, um, it was, I think, 18, Memorial Day of 18. We went down to, so they, they a lot of the guys that were in the film were having a reunion uh, for, and it was at the house of one of the Gold Star families, one of their close friends that had been uh, killed by a sniper in 04 in Iraq. And they do it every year. And so we went down there and hung out with them, really not planning to do much other than to just show the film to them um, via that first cut to get their gut reaction because it changes when you show somebody something. Like you think you, you think you understand what you're watching, but you don't until you see an audience actually react to it. Um, and when that audience is the exact audience that you're, you know, pretending you know something about, um, <clears throat> it it uh, it changes everything, and it changed for us. We we took that first three hour cut and trashed two hours of it, or more than two hours of it, um, and we ended up doing a lot of shooting that weekend that we never planned on doing, uh, which became the, uh, the the core bridge of the film and the emotional arc that that it needed. Um, and it directed the rest of the flow of it completely. It changed everything. Um, but we didn't know. I mean, like you guys are saying, I, I, it's really interesting how like Frank was, you know, he was there. He was ready to tell a story. And, and for us, um, when John started his walk before we were involved, he was a human being who was at his bottom. He was coming off of a suicide attempt and, and, and like, you know, alcoholism and all these other things going on in his life. Um, and he, he was at his bottom. He didn't have anything left. And it was a move of desperation. He started walking because he didn't know what else to do. Mm. Um, and it was about him in the beginning. It was about just trying to figure himself out and, and push himself through physical pain as a distraction for a lot of it, right? Um, you know, what, we all know people who like to run or spin or whatever, you know, it, it's a reboot, right? It, it helps you. And for him, it took him 6,000 miles of rebooting, but you know, um, that's what it felt like. And, and it wasn't until I'd say halfway through, I don't know when it was, when he started to process and realize that it was much more about other people than it ever was about him. Um, it was, Frank's story was almost the exact opposite. It was like, yeah, he started off thinking that you know he's doing this walk to help other people. He's going to yeah. advocate for veterans, and I think it threw the walk. And towards the end, he realized it was about him. You know? He says it so many times. This is as much about me as it is about everyone else. It's about about me moving forward. You know, but that was his moving forward, helping other people and getting mm -hmm. them to take that first step that he wasn't able to take. Keeps him going. You know, it's. Yeah. Uh, and, and of course it is no matter what at the end of the day it's going to be about both i mean there's no way it can't you can't pull those things apart right um but, but i'm curious how you kind of how you kind of sifted through you know honoring that story of the veteran and like you said like you kind of you know it's funny to say you're pretending to know what you're, what you're talking about telling the story. Yeah. it still <laughs> feels like that man it still it feels it started <laughs> off that way until you know we started just embrace our our role in it you know, our role is is to tell Frank's story, and it doesn't mean we can't care any less or or be you know or grow in the way that we look at things or the way that we appreciate our veterans or you know what that means. I mean, the way the American flags looked at and you know mm -hmm. adopted by some people and not by others, and it's like you know if you just it it, it just changed the way we look at all that and all people's viewpoints. 
which I think is Frank's thing too, is like not just people are, you know, processing PTSD different ways, but they're processing everything different ways. And if mm -hmm. more people can embrace just the way that people are processing and appreciate the way that they, you know, arrive at these decisions or the, you know, the, the, the viewpoints they have in their life, then I think more people would just, you know, get along. And just general. talk to other people because I think sometimes we make assumptions, you know, and, and um, you may just judge someone or think about something without asking the questions. And I think we may not fully understand, but- And listening. Yeah, and, listening. And it's, and it's something Frank taught us is just like, you just have to listen. Shut up and listen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's it's a a well As a filmmaker and storyteller, it's hard. You want a director, you want to get out there. You want to kind of control the You story. want to direct. You want to, yeah, you want to know where the story is going. And it's not, you know, it's just not, I mean, that, that one of the, the most beautiful things about docs is, is that, um, whatever the hell you wrote down and thought you were going to make is thrown away in about 10 minutes and will be thrown <laughs> away a hundred more times in the next year or two years or whatever it is um, because of one thing that someone says or one arc that develops you never saw coming. Um, you know, I, they're fun, you know, docs are a lot of fun for that respect. Um, they're a very different world, but, um, you know, they, uh, you try to stay out of the way and not, you know, I mean, every doc is still, you're still manipulating the story, right? No matter how much you want to not do it, you're still editing. You're still choosing what to show, what not to show. Um, you're still choosing to highlight a particular in inflection or tone or whatever it is that you're doing. So, but you, you desperately want to just tell and represent what's there in front of you. Um, but it's hard. You're, you got, you know, you guys are right. It's um, but, but like you said, listening, you know, if you, I think the best documentary filmmakers are the ones that listen the best. I think it's a skill that, you know, we're developing. It's easier you know, said than done. Of course it is. But, but I think the best, you know, you're going to get the most out of somebody when you listen to them. And I think it's a, uh, most That's of what us. these guys taught me. I mean, you guys, I'm sure feel the same way. I, I, you know, uh, it, it, like you were saying like we made a decision like like it was honestly maybe even before we started editing or doing anything other than just gathering footage was is that we were like look this film has to not be partisan in any way like I don't even want to touch that crap like and it doesn't what I you know like same thing you guys said like the most you know it was just an amazing experience because of what it did um, selfishly for myself to open, you know, like I, getting to know people you don't normally get to know is the greatest thing you can do, no matter what. And um, it's just, you know, and being kind of doing that because, uh, you know, it does not matter. Uh, and hanging out with these guys if we feel the same about stuff. At least it, like what that's what I've learned is at the end of the day, I don't, we don't need to share the same views about everything. We can learn, we can still learn about each other. We can still gain empathy and we can still, what I think all three of us would say or three films would say is the most important thing is that bridge between those that hold the knowledge, the veterans um, and those that don't and, and have a wall built up because they don't have the knowledge. You know, so, you know, when you kind of let go which is what it felt like when you're kind of part of that process for years, you know, you're just like, it's a really freeing experience to like, just let go and listen to other people. Hey, I agree. And I think too many of us in this society, we tend to not listen as much. And we, we want to talk, we want to tell our opinions or whatever, but if you can stop talking and, and listen, you know, and then when, when you're making a documentary film, it kind of allows you that opportunity to, to listen and, and stop talking. And, like you said, I mean, that's the, the best way you're gonna learn about something that you don't understand is by, by listening. Um, and, and the partisan thing is something that, that definitely has come up a lot in our conversations because- Well, if, Frank, we, I mean, yeah. we and Frank, we, none of us wanted to have, go near that at all. That also, and it's, it, it was interesting because, you know, we started way up in Buffalo coming through, you know, Western New York, which is one thing. And then ending yeah. up. Oh, yeah. That state's very up, different. Yeah. And ending up in Queens, New York, which is a different, totally different thing. Um, Long hmm. Island. Um, Frank's family is extremely diverse. Um, the people that were on the ground crew are from all walks of life, all political spectrums, you know. Um, we got into some conversations, you know, some, some late night got heated, you know, 
it always ended well. It was always for a good cause. It was always, it was always, you know, look, we're all doing this together. It doesn't, these things don't matter. And the fact that we could come together and do something like that, you know, and get up the next morning and, and you know, put our hands in and be a team and, and do this thing together. I mean, to us, that spoke volumes about what, about the potential of people out there, you know? Yeah, there's this divide that it, it's almost artificial. It's like, it's a, like a wedge put between people that I think, you know, politicians tend to do. And um, when you talk to oh, someone, yeah. you realize they that they live in a box. most times than, than not. And, uh, and veterans, and I mean- More than that, you, you love these people. I mean, yeah. those are people that I now call family and will forever and mm-hmm. never would have if not for this project. And that's what changed. Yeah. It's not, it's not there, just, it says it all, doesn't it? Everybody right. out there, it's, it's no matter what lawn, so, you know, what, what kind of signs on your lawn, it's like, you know, you can still like end up loving that person. You have no idea, you know? Yeah, I, I mean, seriously, I, I, like I said, you know, I, I, can, I can't really think of a better word than blessed. Like, I mean, you know, John, I will, yeah, I mean, like, you know, like I, I, I will love him for the rest of my life. I mean, you know, and um, and and some of the guys that I got to get to meet because, it, like, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, and and would we agree about everything if we hung out? No, but I don't care. Like, I mean, that's you know, like at the end of the day, like, and that's awesome, and and that's changed the way I look at everything. The way I look at the news is the way I look at every, all information. The way I look at new people I meet or new opportunities that come my way. Yeah, I've got a question for you guys. Just if you don't mind me changing the subject yeah, yeah, yeah. to this question. You're doing a lot of talking. No, so. no, it's good. No, I'm loving it. Because <laughs> um, I didn't ex- expect this to happen with my film. I don't know if it's happening to your films or not, but because this my film specifically is about post-traumatic stress and solutions made for anybody battling post-traumatic stress, I thought that audience would be like, oh, solutions? I got to see this film because that's why I produced it for them. The opposite has happened where I've learned that they're not watching the film because they're afraid to. They're afraid that it's going to be uh, triggers watching it. Uh, they're going to rem- oh, yeah. remind themselves of their own trauma. And I've seen people on, on Facebook and LinkedIn, first responders, veterans, promoting my film, encouraging others to watch it, only for me to find out two months later, they've never even seen it because they're afraid to watch it. But based on what everyone else has told them, they're promoting it because, well, I heard from all these people I trust, so that's why I'm promoting it. I'm like, well, you need to watch it. So my biggest struggle right now is trying to figure out how to get these people who need to see it to actually not be so afraid of it so that they will see it and get the help. I would say uh, the number one (laughs) piece... You know, I, I I don't know whether our film is a little further down the line or what whatever it is, but um, what I've learned is that we a thousand percent deal with that. Of course, I mean, I, what you know, like what I learned early on in, in making this project is is that you know, PTS isolates you to the point where your brain ha- doesn't have the natural mirror that the that we all hope to have where our, where our logic is bouncing off of other things and not being isolated in its own head and making up its own stuff. But, you know, the brain is always going to find ways to process, unhealthy or not. Mm. And one of the things that'll, that some veterans do is that they will watch YouTube clips that purposely trigger things. Um, you know, it may be about combat. It may be photo montages. It may be watching reunions of guys come home. It, there's a lot of things it could be. So there does get to a point where they do have to be careful of triggers. Mm-hmm. And um, it's an issue we... You know, our film is a roller coaster and we, we wanted it to be because we knew that, yes, this is heavy stuff, but um, we wanted John's hilarious personality to come out, too, so that people had that relief and that ride mm. um, and to realize that, you know, at the end of the day, this is real ultimately about hope, no matter how hard and heavy it is. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, I mean, I think it's patience. Like, I, I really... Um, documentaries have have a different life than regular film um they they can rise and fall in relevance and topicality um over the course of years or even a decade um and you know i think when it comes to you know like we you know we our goal now at this point we kind of had a little moment in the sun but our goal at this point is yours like how do we get as many people that can actually benefit from this, right? Mm-hmm. And it, it includes civilians, of course. Mm-hmm. But, you know, the first goal is how do you get it to veterans that are isolating now, that are vulnerable to those 
horrible suicide statistics. How do you get it to the families that have already been through right. something horrible mm -hmm. um, and uh, or lost somebody either in combat or after they came home? And um, it's it, a lot of it's uh, patience, consistence, doing things, doing things like this, um, you know, like, but um, I think it's kind of a, a compiling effect over time. I mean, I, you know, like it's, we absolutely have had people say, I just, we had people in the festivals walk out because um, it was too much, wow. it was too much. And they might've watched it later uh, in some cases, or they might not have, be, but you know, at that, you know, it's, um, it's a tough thing to want to make, you know, you know, you, you're asking, it's a big ask. This is a hard yeah. It's a big ask. There's a reason that it's a stigma. There's a reason people have a hard time taking that first step. There's a reason that families don't want to admit that someone they love have a problem. I mean, you know, it's not an easy subject to sell. You know, and like we're fortunate that like we're, we are riding this wave of everyone's kind of talking about mental health finally, like, you know, addressing it in the schools and seeing, you know, on the news. And it's something that at least people know what you're talking about when you talk about PTSD or mental health issues. And, there's awareness months and there's things like that. But, you know, the individual, like you said, it's everyone processes different. So how one person might, you know, might might see this your film, our film, a hundred other people might see it all different ways. So it is, it's yeah, it's tough. And all we can kind of hope is that, you know, what we try to do is show different perspectives. And one in particular was Frank's best friend who we enlisted with and uh went through all those with and Frank, you know, saw Frank get blown up and it, you know, they both went you know, divergent paths and we kind of revisit Pete later and, and their two perspectives on the war is completely opposite, you know, and it's kind of showing like it's okay and they still hug and Pete still walks with Frank and still supports him even though he might not agree, you know, with what he's doing or that it's, you know, that PTSD is even an issue for you, for him or not, you know. But he's obviously actually the only. Or that they should talk about it. There's always, you know, there's a lot. Yeah, I, I, Pete was really interesting to see because it was the contrast was so big and it was so obvious when he when he showed up in the story and it was, you know, you see it in his face and his eyes. You couldn't and believe posture. it. Posture. It was such a mind blowing moment. We've been hearing about Pete for so long when we finally got set up that interview and it was near the end of the shoot. We hit base short. But that's where he lives, and it was just. Uh, you know, the nicest guy you can meet, but it was just after knowing Frank for so long at that point, it was just like, wow. Hmm. And even after having met so many different people, so many different perspectives, it's like, here's this guy whose story I heard and you just, you know, you, know, you develop a picture in your head and you meet him and it's not what you like to picture at all. Hmm. Um, and it's, it is, it's, it's, it's mind blowing. But, but in terms of who was gonna watch the movie and who is gonna be affected by it, I mean, it's, it's definitely a tough thing. Um, I mean, our hope is that, you know, not only to try to get veterans to see it, but if the people that are close to the veterans, so the family members. Exactly, the families. Yep. Just to be able to understand maybe a little bit better what, what they're dealing with. Because I think that one of the things we heard over and over again is that, you know, my uncle was in the war in Iraq and never talked about it. Or, or, or my, my son's having issues and I don't know how to approach him about it. Mm. Um, so the, the yeah. Yeah, family thing, um, the, 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 the uh, the contagiousness of the disease with Frank is what Frank always says about it. Mm. So if we could just shine a light a little bit and let someone understand maybe and a I, little bit better. And I think if you let those families know that they're hurt, I feel like that's like kind of like, you know, a group that doesn't have a voice. It's these families that suffer because it's the ones that are dealing with the abuse and the, you know, whatever it is, you know, and they're, and they're developing their own PTSD. It's a, it's like generational mm -hmm. PTSD. <clears throat> um, so I think, yeah, going after the families and, and the people that are affected in the peripherals, really, really important. I had somebody yesterday, uh, a wife of a um, military guy. He's at the very top of the military. I, he's, a, he's the SEAC, S-E-A-C. He's the advisor to the top general in the country that this general oversees all branches. He's his advisor. His wife, Janet, said yesterday to me that exact same thing. She said, in regards to our film, because she had her and her husband watched the film, but she said, you have no idea the impact your film and all of our films are gonna have on the families because their loved ones, when they get help and they get better and they can handle post-traumatic stress or you know, find a way to battle through it, she said that change in our family structure is going to affect everybody around them so positively. She said, you have no idea what 
what your film has done. And again, I'm relating that to all three of us because is you're you're right. Uh, the family, there are so many affected, and if we can get the help to the people who are battling, that solves the problem for everybody around them, which is great. And we had another lady uh, a couple of weeks ago, or months ago. I don't know, it's been a little while, I guess, but she said, "My, uh, I have my husband back after he tried a treatment in the film. And then she also said, our children have their father back. Now, what a great statement for her to say, my children have their father back. I have my husband back when for years they had all been suffering because of that one man's post-traumatic stress. Now it's behind him, which means it's not behind the family. They can heal. They can move on together. I mean, that's powerful. That's everything. I mean, that's a life really at the end of the day, exactly. that, that's, that's a life that, you know, hopefully never becomes part of uh, the, you know, the 20 a day, you know, you don't, you know, and that's the ultimate is like, you know, mm -hmm. you'll never see that stuff. And, 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 you know, um, but you know, th it, yeah, that really, that is the best thing you can possibly hear. Um, you yeah. know, I mean, we even, we even saw some of that while it was happening. I mean, you know, we, um, obviously a ton of stuff doesn't make the film but you know um a lot of uh, spouses or girlfriends or, or moms or whatever it may be that would tell us um that um even john coming to visit them the one time um was a different was, was something that that pried something loose in them um and you know like for them to see like for the spouse to see John with them and to see that interaction. So in what, you know, like, like you were alluding to earlier is, is like, you know, just the, just the, it PTS teaches you isolate and this is a big country, you know, so mm -hmm. you're scattered to the winds and, you know, all those things are against you. And so, you know, um, you know, if there's one thing money probably should be spent on the most is, is funding these reunions like twice yeah. a year, whatever it is, right? Pay for their flights, pay for a house for them to hang out in for a weekend, Absolutely. like throw money at that, you know? Um, and uh, because it changes these guys, it's a reboot that is something like they can't get anywhere else and they take that back home. And then if a, and if a family member or a spouse actually it gets lucky enough to witness how their face, their body posture, everything about them changes when they're around those guys. Um, you know, one of the, John is such an amazing public speaker. What, something he would say all the time is that, you know, as much as this is for veterans, this is even more for civilians, even more for the families, because mm -hmm. um, what it can do for them is immeasurable. We, we can't see it the same way as like you're saying, you know? Um, and it's just, yeah, it's, it's the few times I got lucky enough to witness it in person. It's something that shakes you to your core because yeah. you, you know, like when you see a veteran around the people that they serve with, I mean, you don't, you don't find bonds like that in too many other ways. Um, and it just teaches you about what human be. I mean, you know, we can kind of try and imagine that okay so obviously they were in the most high pressure situation you can think of and they were forced to kind of become a unit and all of that but we lose sight of that that when they come home they lose that so their greatest strength their superpower uh gets taken away yeah. um the together is their superpower and exactly. I will also say, and this is a complaint that we heard from Frank and from a lot of veterans that we met along the way, is that like, you know, not only did Hollywood never ever do that justice, you know, um, but it's done harm to it. I mean, mm. you know, it never measurable shows. harm. I mean, mm -hmm. not only does it not show the pain of war, but I mean that, but that connection, that kind of, you know, just what these guys go through. I mean, you can't tell it in a story, and it was one of the reasons we wanted to stay away from anything feeling like a vietnam war movie or like mm. trying to glorify that idea of it because it's like you know frank always talks about the fact that you know it's everything that happened after that caused this you know if he mm. if none of the stuff that had happened after had happened and he had just gotten wounded in vietnam he feels like maybe he would have been able to deal with it you know mm. um and that sort of that never gets shown in, in you know they there's a few movies maybe here and there, but in general it's uh it's something that gets completely just left out. So, you know, I feel as our responsibility, like you said, as civilian filmmakers, is to kind of build this community of family, like just to, for veterans to know that we are we are out there. You know, mm -hmm. trying to tell the, the, the real story. 
it's a tough subject like you said it's not it's not a comedy it's it's a hard yeah. story to talk about and uh, i think what all of us are doing which is a really good thing is just adding something to the conversation and, and just having the conversation keeping it going and you know just uh being it, having an open conversation about it and bringing our people yeah. in all our friends and just you know everyone that we know and colleagues that are would not be in that world or would not you know engage in a veteran film or whatever it's just like it's trying to just open up people's eyes and so that it's not a veteran thing why does it have to be this or that why you know and why isn't that interesting to you you know it's a human story so if you can make it and tell the human side of it which is just overflowing these guys are just overflowing with with the human side of it um, you know, it's right there for the taking, then, you know, hopefully people react. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's a long game. Um, you know, I mean, that's, that's the way I look at it is, is that, um, you know, I, I think you won't see a lot of it, but you know, the word of mouth that can happen, um, in so many different ways, you know, I mean, from one family to the next, it mm -hmm. says like, Hey, look, I realize you think that your son or daughter maybe isn't in the place for this, but when we, you know, this really helped us in some way. Right. So like, um, you know, I, I, I think that thing happens, you know, there's uh, it may take a while to bridge outside of the veteran community and sometimes, sometimes, but um, it is such a tight knit community itself that, that, um, that I think over time, you know, a lot of that can happen. Well, it is run our way. I mean, Frank also references the difference in the way he came home from Vietnam to the way that soldiers are coming home now. I mean, that's a huge step, you know, and being embraced and, you know, ads showing, you know, fathers coming home and their kids running to their arms. I mean, you know, we're, we're, we're starting to understand that side, I think, as a society, but it's just beginning. Yeah, well, we're detached. I mean, you know, I can, I can, you know, my, my, uh, you know, I, I feel like my generation, and my, I did, you know, I grew up a military brat, um, but my dad got out when I was fairly young, so it's not like that was a the, this massive imprint, but it was a pretty big imprint because my dad's always been my hero, so basically anything he ever like did or stood for, I looked up to, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, I mean, it's it's yeah. And then there's an interesting question that came up a lot, which is like, you know, and a lot of even Frank supporters who love him and, and love what he's doing would ask him, like, what's your goal here? Like, you know, you know, we have to go to war. Like, like, are you trying to get people like, are you hoping like kids like, you know, to get recruited down or like, well, like, what's the goal here? Like, you know, these are the off camera conversations that we would have. And like, oh, you know, yeah, times Frank didn't have the answer. But for him, it was really just about you know just rethinking the way that we approach the whole system just about education too so not that it's going to eliminate ptsd but at least if you if, if people that are going to the military understand if they had a heads up yeah like that they understand a little bit about it and what it is and they can look for it and be, be prepared for it then it might make it a little bit better on the other end i mean that that's part of what he's trying to do is that education is the key to improving the situation um, Mira, yeah, I mean, they had an interesting question. I'm curious what you guys think. She asked if we had mental health professionals or resources on hand when we were filming and if we were concerned that we would trigger someone. And the mental health professional is um, another audience, I think, that could benefit from these films because um, I think a lot of therapists and, and, and social workers may not have had experience with veterans. Um, for us, we didn't have therapists on board and Frank was very open about the fact that he wasn't a therapist. Um, he's he just not was, a social worker, he's not a clinician, he's just a guy, but he says it to everyone he needs. We, we avoided it on purpose for the most part. That's, that's an, we were, there, look, there's a lot of films out there that take that angle. Um, but um, we had one clinician in our film and the only reason he was probably in it is because he actually served with John um, for years after Ramadi uh, in Human Intel and he was in the same hole John was basically the same thing mm -hmm. um, and he eventually pulled himself out of it um, went back to school became uh, uh, a doctor and a clinician that started working with veterans so like he went full circle all the way so we felt like it was 
I mean, using him was an incredible moment for us because he knew John and because of all of that. But for the most part, we actually tried to stay away from the clinician angle because it just wasn't like a lot of the problems that, um, you know, the barriers to get built in the, either in the VA or in the private clinical world, mm -hmm. whatever, were just not what we wanted to approach. It wasn't going to help. And it was the human story just seemed like a much better bridge. We, uh, we actually met with several and, you know, had long in-depth interviews about all these topics and their treatments and this and that. And, you know, what actually we did end up leaving the only bite, we had two short bites mm -hmm. with clinicians in the film. And the only thing it was to back up the idea that by taking that first step, that statistics shown over the years that by taking that first step leads to recovery and prevents prevention of suicide. And that, you and, know, and that was really, it was really just to back up that claim of, of that first step. But and that therapy mm -hmm. might not be perfect, but it's better. But, but we went through that conversation. Like yeah. we have all these great testimonials, but do we want it to be that? Like, you know, do we want people to then, you know, question what's out there or like have to start raising those, just raising those questions that we didn't really have the answers to in the film itself, I mean. What about you, Michael? Because I know that you did talk to therapists and you were talking to different uh, physicians. Yeah, well, in the film, um, yeah, we definitely talked to uh, therapists and, and uh, doctors and other experts, but mostly because we were introducing for many people new treatments and programs they'd never heard of. And so, um, you know, most people want to make sure it's not just something someone created in their little tent and are now trying to offer to the world that these have doctors behind them, why they work in their doctor expert opinion. Um, if there's any issues with it, you know, if there's any, um, what the success rate is. I mean, just getting it from somebody who knows what they're talking about in our case, it was, I think, Im important to sell it to the audience that this has, this procedure has been vetted. Um, so we, first of all, interviewed a lot of veterans and first responders that benefited from it. So you hear their firsthand experience of where they were suicidal. Some of them had tried to take their lives by suicide, had lost their jobs, families lost everything. They were a mess. And how now, after trying one of these things that we featured in the film, they have their lives back. Many of them, I know sometimes people say you can't get rid of post-traumatic stress. I'm not an expert, so I'm not going to say if you can, but I've talked to so many who told me I no longer have post-traumatic stress. It's no longer affecting my life. So because of that, I, can, I tend to believe that people can get rid of it since I'm hearing so many who have. But to convince the audience, I think you need to hear from those who have succeeded and you also need to hear from the doctors who can say, here are the studies that were done. Here's where those studies were published. Here's why it is accepted. These are the hospitals or the VA or wherever that these procedures are taking place, which gives it validity. So that's why I ended up choosing to put those types of people in there to help encourage them to see that not only are veterans and first responders benefiting, but in addition to that, this is why the experts say it's a viable solution as well. Then to, to the other part of the question was about the trigger. Um, I mean, we did often talk a lot about that one person that's isolated watching this movie that might be angry. You know, maybe he doesn't want to watch the movie. Mm -hmm. He doesn't want to hear Frank's story. He's got his own story to tell. Um, and, you know, that was always on our minds. And we kind of always had that faith in that we didn't see that happen. With Frank. You know, and if, if when his honesty in person was able to influence people, we just had faith that if we can tell the story honestly, um, that it would influence people the same way. And then we, we, we really couldn't speak from a larger perspective of, I mean, it's such a big topic and so many different, I mean, like we said, everyone deals with it differently. All we could do is tell Frank's story. Just, mm -hmm. You know, that, that's the perspective we knew or that, you know, we, that, that's the perspective we were coming from. I think Papa Ron had a question. Yeah. Papa Ron? You're muted. I, I got a thousand questions. <laughs> Good. So, so uh, you know, sometimes I ask the question with to recommend viewing a film, and it's in in therapy. The the therapists and the counselors in the room will know what countertransference is. Is sometimes we're tempted to transpose our experience on to someone else and, and, and make sure they experience it the way they're supposed to. My dad, a world, you know, hardened uh, battleship 
USS Columbia. It was it was a heavy cruiser. Really got beat up in World War II. He could watch Civil War and even Vietnam War movies, but he could not do documentaries and movies about his war. Mm. Um, and and I think he could kind of halfway process some of that stuff. I mean, he my dad was never in therapy. His therapy was a popping Johnny John Deere tractor plowing for days and days and days. That's mm. how he he just drowned out the noise. Mm. Um, and good dad. I mean, you know, but that was one thing because it was just too close to home. But if he could, if he could see it at a distance, he could kind of get through it. That was one thing that I'm, I'm, I'm asking the whole thing and let y'all just go. Um, you know, Mark, you talked about something that struck home. Uh, a lady I know, her dad, Vietnam vet, uh, just a hardened battle warrior kind of guy. And she said, she said after he got out of the military, had five daughters, very successful home, business, everything, just like a very successful person. She said all of that to her seemed like it was second place to that two years he spent in Vietnam. That was like, like it was like that nothing compared to that and nothing compares to war, nothing. I mean, except war. Uh, that was the other one. Uh, I have a question. When oh. you were doing this work for the, the four of you who were doing this work on these films, were there times you broke down and just like couldn't, you had to get away from it? And that was my other question. Um, and then the, when you say you didn't have therapists, um, I, I always go to the thing I, I like. I like art. I hate building manufacturer, and we actually manufacture the buildings here in Colorado. Oh, I don't know. I, I, I like I somebody. Me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I say <laughs> I, I, I like I like art. I hate posters. Art lets me think, and and posters tell me what to think. I mm. like stories. I hate lectures because stories let me think, and post and 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 lectures tell me what to think. So I'm mm. going to turn you loose. Y'all can respond how you want to. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> I mean, I like that, man. I like that. I, uh, my brain works that way. Um, I like to stare at stuff and figure out what it's telling me and why I'm bringing what I'm bringing to the table for it to tell me that. Um, Cause that's all, you know, that's what we are when we walk up to something, whether it's a book or a film or whatever it is. Um, you know, we're, we're seeing ourselves being engaged with something as much as we're actually seeing whatever was put there. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I can tell you that uh, the, in terms of the high of war, I can tell you over and over and over again, um, I heard people say that um, one of the things that is tough for them to talk about is that combat is a high that is never, ever going to be reached again. It is a heightened sense of awareness and vigilance and emotion that you don't even necessarily, you don't, I mean, you realize that what the danger and everything else that's going around you, but you don't realize you're having that your system rewired. Um, and you do not, when you come home, I heard people say over and over, you know, the, the stunning shock that you have no way to get that again um, is is very tough. It's a very difficult part of the transition and it's something that's, that, that sticks with them. Um, you can find really bad ways to try and chase that. Um, you know, get from as simple things as like anger um, uh, to, you know, things that can take your life. Um, but- um, yeah, yeah. Heroin addicts call it chasing the dragon. You know, the only thing that's gonna match heroin is heroin. You know, it's like, it's, it's it. It's like, I, I don't like to make that comparison, but you're right. It's like nothing compares. And when you get that thing, uh, the other thing was the therapist thing I wanted to. So like, if you have therapists around when you're doing filming and watching that, they're, they kind of get duty bound if they're in scope to report 
and 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 intervene things like that so i can understand why you wouldn't want them there mm -hmm. uh but what about what about the uh is it too close is it you know is it is it too close for some of these veterans or are too soon um uh, yeah i mean that can only be decided by them of course now granted so we had you know again again i have to say uh in terms of how lucky we got uh, you know, the reason why the people that talk to us, the families, the siblings, the loved ones, the other veterans talk to us is because of John, like he, people trust him. And when he vouched for us, that was it. That was, that was the end of the conversation. They, if they, if, if he said, you know, I, I, I want you to do this, if you haven't, if you can do it, they would do it. Right. Doesn't mean everyone did. There were plenty of people that couldn't go there. And um, if there were plenty of people John reached out to on his walk that just were not bringing somebody into your home to bring all that up, you do have to be in a certain place, right? And um, not, yeah, of course not everyone could do that. Um, you know, I don't know what the numbers were in terms of how many said yes and how many said no, but there were plenty. Um, and, it, you know, and that's even without bringing us into the equation. That's just him. You know, can you imagine um, the level of trust it takes to bring some stranger with a camera into your house who's going to ask you questions with zero clue, really, as to what, you know, like you try really hard, but you don't, I can't, it doesn't matter how many veterans I meet for the rest of my life. If I spent every waking moment for the rest of my life with veterans, I will never, ever understand, ever. And um, I can try, and I believe the trying part is extremely important because <laughs> it's what get, makes us make progress. Mm -hmm. But I have to always remind myself, I can't understand ever. Uh, I don't know what it's like to wake up and be thinking about death all day. I don't, you know, it doesn't matter what I've been through in my, old, my own life. It's not the same. Um, so yeah, I, they're definitely, you also asked, like, are there, were there moments that you, it was too much for yourself? Um, uh, yes, sure. But I tried to tell myself to never walk away because of that. Um, there were moments that it was overwhelming. I, I can tell you just, and I was removed from a lot of it, right? Like Brian did a lot of the, the filming on his own in the beginning and I was there for, for, for a decent amount of stuff at the end. But um, I can tell you just from being the guy that was watching hundreds of hours of footage like, till their eyes bled and from 24 hours a day, hmm. I can tell you that I broke down a lot, mm -hmm. a lot, a lot. Um, but I tried to, uh, it was a conscious decision on my part to try and push through it because I felt like if they're willing to do this, I need, you know, I need to push myself to be able to, to, to you know, handle that, I guess, as the best as I can. Um, it felt like, I, like, I felt like I was, uh, you know, it just felt like this unbelievable honor to be able to work on it. So I just felt a responsibility that um, I needed to put most of that aside to be able to create something. Mm -hmm. First of all, Mark, I totally agree when you're I mean, a civilian, you know, I feel a tremendous, uh, you know, I, I feel honored to be able to tell the story, but also, you know, a, a responsibility because we're never gonna really understand. All we can do is try to tell the story the best that we can. Um, and, uh, no way we'll ever know because we didn't fight in those wars. For me, I, you know, as a filmmaker, you try to train yourself when you're in these emotional situations. The, the camera kind of acts as a barrier in a way, and uh, you're behind that lens. You might, you know, something you may be getting emotional with in the moment. You, you try to train yourself, you know, just focus on the, make sure it's in focus, make sure you have a shot. <laughs> you try to think about it in a, from a technical perspective because. That, uh, you're trying to take yourself out of your purpose, yourself like, out. yeah. And but, then, but but then again, when you're watching the footage, like you said, I mean, there's definitely well, that's when you're reliving it. You're breaking down. It's months later when you're just like watching this conversation that you remember that you can't believe happened, and it's just as emotional to you today as it was, you know, 
six months ago when you shot it. It, 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 could, it could actually be more emotional because as you said, when you're filming it, you're thinking about so many other things. The shot's right. The focus is there. There's a lighting change. If there's a window. You're thinking about so many other things. And then when you're editing, to just sit there and watch it and fully watch it. You're like, whoa, <laughs> that's powerful. Yeah. You can't, yeah, you can't cry while you're giving an interview. It's, it's not, it doesn't work well. So like, I, yeah, that definitely happened to me. Like I, I definitely remember being kind of gate mouthed many times, like during interviews and, but being a mess, uh, weeks later and, and, and looking at it again. Yeah. And our, and our experience varies a little bit because we had Frank who was sort of this angel on our shoulder the whole time. <laughs> with the subject but then once we'd have these like moving conversations you know we'd leave the room with frank and you know he would be there with us to be like holy shit like did you see that like you know we would debrief together and it would be either mm -hmm. like you know plus he's there to lift up these people you know so mm -hmm. it was like as down as it was getting he's trying to there to inspire so you know he, he wouldn't let it go to those places it was kind of there to like let's talk about this and let's not get it then we're just gonna we're just gonna talk about it like two people and just lay our cards out on the table and for frank uh, it was all about moving forward like that was his mantra like mm. it's about ripping that band-aid off so he didn't like to go down those places where it was like let's cry about this he, he liked to like rip the band-aid off and let's start to heal it to tell me your issues and like you know what are you doing what, what are you doing in your life to fix it you know what are the problems you're having and, and it was funny because you get guys mm. talking about schizophrenia losing their families and like they're telling you it as though you know they're reading a script and a story like you know a lot of these guys they weren't breaking down and telling us their story it was well you know this happened and then this happened and this happened and i lost my wife and my kids you know mm -hmm. and it's like you know it almost even more forces you into those shoes of like the reality of what these guys have gone through you know it's not this drama that's written out it's these guys lives that they're just kind of like laying out for you it makes it real yep. yeah very real so I was going to say to Marilyn, because uh, she wrote, uh, she's heard that sometimes the best therapists are veterans working with other veterans. And one of the organizations that I love, 220.org, because they're doing such great work, uh, their whole focus is peer to peer. And so um, they've got people who are trained with their particular protocol in every aspect, firefighters, police officers, 911 dispatchers, um, every branch of the military. And so if somebody calls in and needs help, he'll have an Air Force person call back that Air Force veteran because they know what they, even the different branches are very different. So having that peer to peer to support and somebody who can help them through it, walk them through the protocol that can change their life, they can open up much faster and quicker with somebody who they know understands them because they even though they don't know them personally yet, but they still know they can understand them because we, you fought fires. I fought fires. You were a police officer. I was a police officer. Now they can heal. I, I have a question for you guys about that related to that. Like, you know, we had a question last night at one of our Q and A's about um, a young guy asked us about, you know, the difference between soldiers that serve now with all the technological advances and, you know, and how is it different from how they relate? You know, it was interesting to hear Frank's response and some of the other guys on the stage. But I'm curious, you know, uh, you know, Mark, if, if you've seen, it's John, right? The character. John, yep. Yeah. So I'm curious if John interacts, is it, you know, if he interacts with other soldiers from other wars, is it, is it you know, just his guys? Uh, and, and with you, Michael, too, is it, do you see the treatment coming from like one group more than another? Um, and I'm just, you know, curious what your take is on the difference. and how different generations are approaching this problem? Uh, from what I, no, no again, <laughs> John's a bit of a unicorn, I realize, but like, <laughs> I never saw him have put up or, or any kind of barrier. Like, like, I mean, he would, he got approached very frequently on his walk by Vietnam veterans um, and, you know, um, and had stories that people would say like, um, uh, about their 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 fathers that were in World War II and they were in Vietnam. I mean, like, yes, it does, of course, happen sometimes because generational things. I think more than anything might put up barriers than than you would be differences in combat. I, I mean, I I never saw John like do anything but look at it as as this is all the same. Like, I mean, granted, yes, the kind of combat um, that was experienced in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan was was different in a lot of respects. Um, but 
the, the bottom line is, is, is the effects, you know, were what they think about, I think, when they talk to each other. I mean, I, I just never saw that, the barriers that, I know that they happen. Um, like it seemed to us that the Vietnam vets, the group in and of itself, like, you know, yeah, seems to reach out to other veteran groups. They, they kind of, it, it's the Vietnam guys, they stick uh, they had a very unique experience as, as you know, I mean, uh, you know, look, I mean, the public consciousness matters a lot, right? And we, we all know that like during World War II, um, you know, the greatest generation and all of that, like it was a, it was a, it was a cause that for 99% of people, they didn't do anything but say, hell yeah, of course we have to do this, right? And when they came home, well, you know, look, there's a, there were, there were plenty that weren't welcomed home, you know, and there were a lot of other reasons for that, but there, but it was different back then. Um, and, you know, so what, you know, Vietnam was very different because they were not welcomed home. Um, and, you know, that's one thing John talks about a lot is that, you know, the importance of just saying welcome home, it doesn't matter how long they've been home. If it's been 50 years, they still deserve to be said that you're, wel you're welcome here. And, you know, in the beginning of the conflict that we've been fighting now for 25 years or what, 20 years, um, they weren't welcomed home either, you know, and some of those attitudes started to change a little bit, um, but still they deal with it quite a lot. Um, you know, there's, we are a um, insanely privileged country um, that is bubbled from almost everything that goes on in the world outside of our own bubble. We don't really uh, understand why we have that bubble and, and, and the fact that, you know, um, you know, no matter what you believe or side you think you're on, like, I mean, um, you can step back and, and see some of that. These, these are volunteers today, all of them. And, you know, they, their job is not to question why they're being sent. Their job is to be ready. Their job is to be ready, you know, um, and that's what they did. And, um, you know, and, and so they felt it, it's tough. It's tough to come home and feel like you're not welcome, um, to feel like you were somehow part of some governmental decision that you, of course, had nothing to do with. Well, it's, it's interesting you say that because everyone, you know, close to me that I've told even when we started making this film that we were doing this, um, you know, I'd get around to the part that you know, when Frank enlisted, and that always surprised everyone. I'm like, why did that surprise you? And they're like, well, just assumed he was drafted. It's like, well, why do you assume that? You know? Oh, yeah, people don't <laughs> understand the numbers. Yeah, like you said, it's that perception of the Vietnam War. It's just like, you know. Yeah, you know, a ton of people <laughs> volunteered. Yeah, that's, that's what Hollywood did, right? They made us think everyone was forced into going. Uh, that's not, I mean, my father volunteered to go. He didn't end up going because they wouldn't let him. But I can tell you, he, that was the very first thing he did after he got out of school was he walked up and volunteered. A lot of people volunteered to go to Vietnam. Um, just like every other conflict. I think there might be some questions. We should probably jump and see yeah. if anybody has. Because I know they're all muted, I think. But <laughs> does anybody have questions? Uh, I wanted to. Sorry, Brian. No, go ahead. I wanted to comment. I've seen uh, Michael and I have conversed and uh, I've watched the film with my husband, uh, Matt and Ryan and Mark, you don't know, I'm a, was a police dispatcher, retired police dispatcher. My husband's police officer, retired. But um, I watched Michael's with my husband and uh, I'll tell you, I cried through it and so did he not because it was horrific, but the fact that somebody was even acknowledging this was happening and that there was really help out there and that uh, it's okay. But I, I tell everybody I meet, people really need to see it. And I think that the three productions here that you guys being civilians sharing that story means a lot more than if it was a first responder who had created that film. Mm. And I think that gives a little more credibility. Um, and Michael, I share him all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Ryan and Matt, I have uh, watched Frank's story and correct me if I'm wrong, but doesn't he talk about Charlie's house? Is it Charlie's house? And 
and Marilyn had asked about uh, uh, about like uh, therapists and that. But if I remember correctly, there was a person there because you can't drink that that broke that rule, and that he later then connected with Frank about it, and they got him back on track. I think what Marilyn said is so true that another vet sitting with another vet mm -hmm. and sharing and supporting lots of times will do more than what a therapist who does not understand does. And that's why 220 is so important. And, and I believe in those guys too. And uh, Mark, sorry, I haven't seen John's story yet. So that'll have to go next on the list. But um, I, as you guys were talking, I was thinking about, you know, Remembrance Day and that week of showing movies and, and past old war movies and stuff. This would be an ideal thing to have, and I think, for families to, to see together yeah. during, during those times, whether I know, Mark, Michael, you're doing, uh, people are, are supporting you in having groups for first responders, but it's really the families that really need to understand that we're not broken, we're right. just different now, and we have different moral values and stuff because of what we've gone through and that it's important for them to understand we're not angry at them you know it, it, they just have to understand that we're just maybe not the same hmm. yeah uh john one of the things that comes up who well, came up a lot in filming uh and it, it shows up in the actual audio of the film as well is that you know john says all the time uh and, his, and the people he served with is that um, they're not victims, they're survivors. And, and that's how yes. they, they, need, they, they need others to understand how important it is to think that way. Um, it's not just them telling themselves that that's what they need. They need us to understand that. Um, so. Yeah, Frank's very clear about that too. He, he talks about, you know, the, when you live with PTSD, you're a survivor. And it's very clear to call himself a survivor and to talk about people that, you know, are survivors of PTSD. Um, and Janet, thank you for that because, you know, there's a, a bit of an insecurity as a civilian telling these stories. So I'm, mm -hmm. I appreciate hearing that. Um, it was nice that Frank's family too, that you guys, uh, not all of them spoke, but the ones that did about their time with their dad and how things have changed. That That's so important for us to realize and for our family members. And I know I shared it with my my son and his fam uh, and his partner. I said, and they have uh, a friend who was uh, in, in the military going through PTS. And, and I said, just share it. Like family needs to understand yeah. that, you know, not everybody can be on that other call you talk about crying while you're watching that but if you start crying while you're filming you're not being of service and mm -hmm. me as a police dispatcher or a military person doing their job or or a police officer we have to put all those emotions down because mm -hmm. if i'm emotionally upset for that person i'm not doing them any service or any mm -hmm. favors and for other people to realize like I know that um, I had found before I went through treatment was that I had totally disconnected with my emotions and feelings. I didn't know how to have fun anymore. I didn't understand. I didn't realize that that was happening to me that, you know, sure you laugh at things and that, but I mean, the actual fact of, I, I, fun that there was a night and I call, I wrote a piece 10 years later that call I called the night the mask cracked because that's what happened you wear this mask it's so tight on you had everything buried down and I was injured in an accident and I couldn't keep busy enough to keep that down and it all came up and I think that we can go of different routes we can go the drug route we can uh George I think it was Chris was talking about about addiction so we're addicted to it if we can't keep that addiction being busy holding that down something's got to give mm -hmm. so that's why i think your stories are you're producing these stories and directing them take away from richard's house was you know they talked about idle hands you know all these guys had tasks they all had jobs to do 
Um, if they didn't get the kitchen cleaned up, the chores done, they didn't do certain things. They didn't have TV. They didn't get to go out or do whatever, you know. Um, it was really interesting. And to some of these guys, I think it was part of needing that, you know, that um, the, the regiments, the, the daily regiment that they had in the military to sort of keep them going. Mm. For other guys, it's just having a watchful eye. Um, but yeah, a lot of these guys did sort of come along as part of our family. You know, Frank called it the walk with Frank family. Like to mm. walk with Frank was a philosophy. Like you now walk with Frank, you wear the pin, you got the hat, like you're part of the team, like whether you like it or not, you know? <laughs> um, unfortunately, yeah, you know, COVID hit and, you know, we, we did try to stay in touch with as many of these guys as possible. And as <clears throat> great as a lot of them are doing some not so great. So it's, uh, you know, just, just further validates what we're doing and why it's so important. And like you said, Mark, like when, when you are in the military, you have this brotherhood, you know, or you're with your sisterhood or, you know, you're just, you're, you have a connection, your family. And then mm -hmm. when you get out, a lot of the veterans feel like uh, they're isolated when they're in regular life and they don't, uh, they don't have that same connection. Um, well, Richard's house was that uh, it's a uh, transition home in um, Rochester, New York. And, it was a really special place. I mean, partially because of that, because of that family atmosphere. And I think a lot of the veterans that stayed there really responded to that. I mean, they ate dinner every night together. It's like, it's a rule you know, where we are all at the table at six o'clock. You know, mm. Speaks volumes, you know, just why, symbolically why they do that. It's, it's that family, um, that family mentality. And like you guys were talking about before, about therapists um, being veterans or having that, like a police officer, uh, speaking to another police officer, we had a lot of veterans. Um, even Peter, the the you know, Frank's best friend, at the end of the film, talks about how he only can relate to combat veterans. Like that, that was you know that's who he relates to, and that's who he talks. And to. And that's okay to him. Like that's, that's all right. That's how he deals with it. And, and we had some veterans really skeptical. Like even with Frank, like oh, who are you, a social worker? Like I don't want to talk. And uh, I know that people like veterans are suspicious of a therapist or a social worker especially if they're not a you know if they haven't served and they don't understand that experience so i think those organizations and i think it's partly about. just because of their experience trying to be fit into a box with right. good social workers or treatments in the past they're just right. like what box are you guys trying to fit me in which is not what we were trying to do. right and, there's and i think you guys too and i think there's nothing like, wrong with a therapist not being a being a veteran but i think those organizations like you're talking about that try to pair a veteran with, with another veteran or or at least somebody that has an understanding, it helps. Um, but that's tough, you know, it's tough when you have this experience that uh, you know other people are gonna have a hard time understanding. I mean, look, just from your experience with John and, and, and uh, you know, Michael, your experience with your treatment, it's like the treatment comes from, you know, from seeking it out and from, you know, connection, whether it's connection with someone that has a solution or connection to brothers in arms. Um, or both brother in arms who does have the solution that's brain that can do yeah that's yeah um yeah i just think it's so just awareness just awareness mm -hmm. that is there there's yep. different things that are, different people respond to different treatments and different you know everyone's different with the way that they that they kind of handle the, the trauma absolutely um but it all starts with connecting i mean it's all about connecting in some way to somebody for some reason I and mean, frank mm -hmm. talks about the first step you know i mean it's it's, all, it's the hardest thing and whatever that first step is for you, whether it's uh, making that phone call to a friend or just mm. saying things out loud or just talking to your wife or whatever. I mean, it's whatever that first step is, is always the hardest, um, but it's, it's the most important. Absolutely. I think Brian had a question earlier. Do you want to go jump to that? Yep. Brian, did you have a question? Yeah, thanks guys. Um, so I'm a uh, post-traumatic stress survivor as well. I've been living with it for 20 years. Um, Actually, I sat up with Brian and Matt, uh, I think a week ago or so, mm. um, one of their Zoom calls. Um, <clears throat> but I'm just curious, um, to all three of you, uh, you know, with what, if, if you had any kind of um, <clears throat> preconceptions about, about what post-traumatic stress disorder is or what it looks like, um, you know, for, like, for example, you know, something that I've always dealt with was the way Hollywood tends to interpret it. Yeah look very you know they come off looking very crazy like snap at the you know, smallest thing or whatever i'm just wondering if you guys took any of that into consideration when you started your projects um as well as how um that might have changed as you went through it well i can if you don't mind i'll start that one because that was something that was really big with with my film i did not know anything about post-traumatic stress 
And um, I was so ignorant that I thought it was something that only the military dealt with. I had no idea first responders and me, anybody can get post-traumatic stress. So that was one huge learning thing at the very beginning. Uh, the other one was that back then they were, you know, everybody was saying post-traumatic stress disorder, but as we did more and more research and I had veterans, cause I was doing a lot of press and, and interviews and things, mm -hmm. even in the early days when I first started, uh, and I'd get emails from people just letting me have it because I'm not a disorder, you know, <laughs> and you know, I don't have a disorder and you're on TV calling it post-traumatic stress disorder. And he goes, yeah. you're really pissing me off. And so after getting a few of those emails and doing more research, I uh, realized, you know what, um, what I've learned um, is that it's not a disorder. And so we talk about it in the film mm -hmm. that we, I say um, that it's a normal reaction to a traumatic event, but it's a normal reaction. And it's a reaction that we, our, our bodies, we all, you know, can react to depending upon the trauma. Um, and so we do talk about that just to make it clear so that people watching the film who feel like they are broken or abnormal, we're trying to say, no, you're not, you have an injury. Right. And, you know, some people call it PTSI, you know, post-traumatic stress injury or post-traumatic stress, but the whole disorder thing we're trying to get rid of because we don't want anyone to feel broken or disordered when the reality is it's normal what they're experiencing. We just want to help them now through the treatments and programs featured in the film, help them get that behind them and get their lives back. I'd like to, I mean, my, my conception going in was so, so fueled by Hollywood because, you know, we're movie guys. This is where, mm -hmm. you, know, and, you know, the veterans in our family were, you know, World War II and didn't really talk about it at all and passed away when we were young and unfortunately never had that chance to really dive deep into that. Um, but, you know, the way they show flashbacks, you know, mm -hmm. like think about it as one thing. And the way that Frank started talking to me about it, and just really like, you know, I'd be there the night he'd had one of these nightmares or, you know, mm -hmm. whatever it was, and it's not what it is. And yeah, my, you know, my idea of what it was to what, you know, what I, how I see it now is completely changed. And, you know, that's one of the reasons I feel like, you know, I want so many of my civilian friends and civilians to see this. Our, our grandfather fought in the Battle of the Bulls in World War II. Wow. But I mean, I wish that we were able to have those conversations, you know, now that we're adults. I mean, he passed away when we were teenagers, but, you know. And, and, and then at the same time, on the flip side of, um, of what Michael was talking about, it's, uh, and, and your Frank talks about it all the time, is like, you know, again, you're, you're trying to get fit into this box. These guys want to get benefits. They want to, you know, you, you guys want to get, um, you know, you want to get benefits from, from, from the Army. Um, at the same time, there's a lot of people that are, like, throwing that term, you know, post-traumatic stress around, you know, just because they, you know, this or that. And, you know, we got into a lot of arguments about people about what is it or how do you define it and stuff like mm. that. Like, you know, it's hard to, and then that's why kind of Frank says, like, it's, it's how you interpret your own, you know, it, how you, how broken do you feel? Like, how do you, mm. how do you sort of identify it yourself? Um, and I think that's, you know, I think that's important, but, um, you know, I'm curious about that. Like, you know, if, uh, you know, Michael, you've seen that or, you know, just about like that question of, you know, what, where does it get defined to be the point of like, you know, this is something that needs to be, you know, treated at this level or, you know, addressed at this level, or this is something that's just, you know, you know, just, you know, post, you know, just stress on a, on a, on a basic level. Yeah. Well, I mean, I know I, I heard one definition, which is, kind of made sense to me you know the reason they still say there's a reason it can be called a disorder is because is it so affecting your life is the post-traumatic stress so affecting your life that as i guess maybe frank would say you know is it causing a, a disorder you know is, is your whole life falling apart you know that maybe it's gotten to the point where this post-traumatic stress is a disorder in your life but i don't i don't know to be honest because i'm not an expert you know it's just i most of my talk to are just like it's I'm, I, I'm not disordered. I don't, it's an injury and it is normal. And so that's kind of narrative we're kind of pushing, but I, I don't exactly. That, having that stigma and part of trying to break that stigma and trying to get Yeah, it. exactly. Well, it's really, it's really all about the stigma though. I mean, you know, as somebody who's been in it for 20 years and have done a considerable amount of therapy, I've tried pretty much just about everything. Um, and I still live with it. I mean, for me, it's kind of like, you know, just imagine the, the most horrific day of your life right? Where your entire world flips upside down. And, you know, maybe you should have died that day or maybe not. Like mine was not yeah. combat related, right? So like I was, it wasn't on a battlefield or whatever, but it's like imagining the most horrific day of your life 
and like you continue moving forward almost like i almost could say like i died that day right mm-hmm. like kind of drifting through life like figuring out what the hell is my path that kind of thing um but yet while you're doing that every single day it's like constantly on your mind like a broken record it just goes and goes and goes and goes and goes and goes and goes so it's almost like like these days i've almost got like two parallel thoughts right like what mm-hmm. i'm doing right keeping my mind busy idle hands whatever keeping that keeping the mind distracted but even while it's distracted it's still there you know what i mean it's just like no matter um no matter what you do no matter how how hard you try to like you know either block it out or you try to work through it or or whatever else the case may be it's there you know so it's not a question of you know does it give you necessarily a disorder you know whatever um but it's more like can you learn to live with it can you learn to manage it that's yeah. my thing. I feel like, you know, yeah, there's no one way to, to sort of define it. And, <clears throat> um, yeah. you know, like Frank, Frank talks about that broken record all the time. And that was sort of how I started mm. thinking about, you know, trying to put yourself in, in that and in trying to understand what that is like. Well, yeah, Frank um, also talked about the fact that it was defined differently through the years. I mean, and that's what I was going to get yeah. to is about how, you know, he, it being defined as post trauma just gave that's, him an understanding yeah. of it. You know, mm-hmm. um, you know, depressive neurosis is what they called it for years. Like that didn't give him any tools to like try to understand what they called it shell shock. I mean, there's lots of names mm-hmm. that, and, um, uh, and the World War II veterans were just, uh, you know. And then at the same time, we met people that were like, you know, we met the brother of one of the teachers that was killed at Sandy Hook Elementary. Um, and he spoke to us about his post trauma. And it, it's wow. like, there's no different from Doc, who was a combat medic, who again, I was like, well, I never thought of a medic. You think of the guys that are out there killing. You don't think of the guys that are taking back the people and treating them. No, those so docs, man. All these, in, in all these ways. Tell a changed. lot of medics. Yeah, it's rugged. In all Love. these ways, it changed the way that I look at, at people that serve in every capacity. But and I mean, even them, but their wives, the, the ones that they came home to and then were affected. It's just like, to me, once I realized that it was just this like, this wildfire spreading around, like it is an epidemic. Yeah. Um, you know, no one talks about it the yeah. way, you know, it doesn't matter what you call it. It's well, just a matter of understanding. Well, that's, that's the biggest thing, though. I think you hit the nail on the head, Matt, is that nobody talks about it. And that's the biggest problem. Yeah, People look, we had a pandemic. don't want to talk about it. it was the they don't talk about it, then their loved ones don't know anything about it. Medical professionals don't know about it. You know, like, uh, one of the biggest problems in my, in my experience with PTS is that, you know, uh, it's the butt of a lot of jokes because people just don't, they don't mm. get it. Like I had a, I had an acupuncturist a um, couple months ago through the, through the VA, right? And uh, she was trying to compare, so mine was non-combat related. I was uh, drugged and raped by another man, sexual trauma kind of thing, um, which was in a, <laughs> tough enough as it was. Like my, you know, my sergeants were trying to tell me I was committing highway robbery and shit like that, right? Like it was fucking ridiculous. But uh, I had an acupuncturist like two months ago. She tried to relate my PTSD. She's like, oh, I had PTSD too. She's like, I had it once. I got stuck oh. on the side of the road with two hours to drive and I had a flat tire. I had such PTSD from it. Oh my and God. I'm like, dude, you're a medical professional at the VA. I'm like, it's got to be the largest healthcare system that in the world with probably the largest population of PTS patients. And you're going to try to compare. Yeah. The most horrific day of someone of a, of a veteran's life to getting stuck on the side of the road. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I got a fat tire. I had such PTSD. Like, wow. Break people. Like, <laughs> you know. But it, but again, it's if you don't talk about it, nobody knows what the hell's going on, it's right? Yeah. Cool. It, you know, they wear ribbons for cancer at football games. They support you know kids brain tumors i mean it's all these things have a have a cause that, you know it's like but once you get start talking about mental health people are like ah like we don't want to you know. or they think hey we're just going to say the number 22 or we'll do 22 push-ups or something like that to raise awareness but still nobody right. okay, okay hey, yes there's 22 here. veterans committing suicide every day it's a travesty like it's, it's terrible a, right I think it's a comfort level on our part to hear a story <laughs> like yours and be like it's okay like yeah you know I have no idea and I cannot understand, but like, it's okay. You know, and you can talk about it. And like, all I can do is try to like, try to put myself in those shoes, yeah, you know, yeah. try to like think of my worst experience and amplify it by a million and wonder what if that was repeating over and over in my, you know? Um, and it's just more people could just understand, like yeah. to me, it's just about the it's just about empathy, you know? 
You know, if I can piggyback on that too, one thing that I always like to share with people is uh, five years ago when I was in class, there was a veteran sitting right next to me. And that's why we're, this is happening with the power of our story. It was mm -hmm. one veteran sharing a little bit of a story. I got curious. I heard more of his story. Then I invited my family and then I invited everybody else. And um, in fact, Marilyn really put on this huge forum where um, over 600 people came. And, I, and I'm sharing this because what you all are doing with your film, if we could do this with one conversation, yeah. the fact that um, as a civilian, it blew my mind. How could I not know this? We're sending people out to war to protect us. How, as a civilian, do I not understand or know this? Mm. And so again, those stories and these documentaries, you know, it lands in the right lap, the right civilians. And there's something in a lot of us that want to protect our protectors. Yeah. And so I, I love that you're doing this. I love that you guys did such a great job in doing like all three of your documentaries. Thanks, um, fantastic. I love the age difference between John and Frank. And then I love the hope that Michael Geyer comes in this other direction of, wait a minute, maybe PTS is really not forever and showing these other. So it's just like this beautiful variety of different experiences with people who are willing to be so vulnerable with their stories that um, again, the power of storytelling, it grabs our hearts and we wanna help. So um, I'm just, I'm excited to hear this conversation. I'm so excited about your work. Um, yeah, love it. <laughs> yeah, Brian, you, you, hit, you hit a nerve with me with post-traumatic stress mm -hmm. uh there's a huge movement to call it post-traumatic stress injury yeah mm -hmm. uh because 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 this is not a disorder it's a it's a natural response to trauma it is very much and the way the way response to trauma should go i mean <laughs> i mean seriously when you think about it, if somebody ex exposed to extreme trauma over a short period of time that's that's exactly how it's supposed to go you know yeah. that's not a disorder that's a that's a valid human response to, to trauma and then the other thing you know if you want people to uh just an observation if you want to people to have a little bit of an experience about them have them uh, line up with michael being on focus and then a little bit after do the editing and break down, that's post-trauma. You know, that's a natural emotional response to exposure to something that's horrible, mm. you know, those kind of things. And then the last thing I wanted to ask you about, because I got this listening to Frank and watching some of the trailers and that, is in World War II, when they came home on ships, it was a slow process of playing cards and coming yeah. home. They had a chance there uh, to, in essence, decompress. Yeah. And I think coming home too quickly, we get the emotional bends and we decompress too quickly and we get those those embolisms mentally that, that are really tough. I mean, and it seemed like that with, with Frank, this, watching that, it was an opportunity for him to do a long, slow decompression. Uh, and that felt that felt very healthy for me. And I think we could really maybe uh, that. And then back to Brian, every, I'm on the one VA community advisory board here in San Diego between the directors and the community. And I always bring up compared to what? When you say it's terrible compared to what? You know, when you got people that the most dangerous thing they do is drive to and from work and how horrible that is, yeah. well, compared to other things. so. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you do that, it's like the, there is no hospital network in, in the United States as complex as the VA and as large as the VA. They're just, they don't exist. You know, it is the largest. So I mean, compared I just, to what? But when I, but when I say that too, like, I'm just like, okay, like the largest, largest healthcare system in the country, you probably have the most PTSD, PTS patients, whatever in the mm -hmm. world. Like it would seem like the, 
like the first thing you do day one of orientation is some sort of like PTS sensitivity training or something, right? Yeah. Like, because yeah. she and they, you did that. I had a psychiatrist appointment uh, two weeks ago. And the guy told me, he's like, well, he's like, we've done everything. You know, we've tried every treatment, every met, every drug, every, every therapy thing that that's available through the VA. You're just going to have to sit tight and wait for another thing to get through. And wow. so I was like, I was like, I'm so I go, so what are you saying, doc? I'm fucked. Yeah. I've been living with this for 20 years. And he snickered. He laughed at me. <laughs> like, you know, he's like, basically by laughing, he's agreeing that, yeah, I'm fucked. And I might as well just go kill myself. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm not going to do that because I'm up to other things right now, you know. Yeah, and, and not stuff. understanding. We, you know, we. It's, it's insane, you know. You would think yeah. that that's the one. And and the other part is with the VA, I walk around the VA, I feel like it's, it, I've got some foot friendlies around me, mm-hmm. you know. Yep. And then, and then, uh, so, but I don't get that at other hospitals, even close to that experience, mm-hmm. you know. So it's like, it, it's like, it's compared to this compared to that and yes they should and uh and if by chance i'll put my uh, if you want to uh text me and share which hospital uh west network LA. You're in, uh, west LA. where uh, west los angeles west yeah. la yeah. uh i'm i'm like i say i work with the director of the va here and that goes all the way up to vision 22 and to the secretary of the va uh if it's something that they need to uh address in a more global fashion uh you know i'll take it all away yeah i mean so my only experience with the va system has been la um been been about the last two years something like that um and for the most part they've been good but like you know like i said in the last two months i've had two different doctors you know both you know mental health wellness type of doctors that had a response like that and i'm just like I mean, yeah. if, that's, if that's my experience one guy just you know imagine yeah, that, just you know, that. yeah. So, you're not the only one there's no way there's no I'm possible not, way i just i've heard that too i've heard that too from people from that, yeah, we, i mean uh, i hear it all the time i, I yeah. hear it more than i hear positive whether yeah. or not that's fair that's the reality right um, that's ridiculous I'd like um, to I, I think i think a question that really needs to be asked by <laughs> is look i mean you know in michael's film there's a bunch of different treatments and and i mean there's sgb is something i've been very interested in fascinated by so i'm probably more versed in that but um you know we need to start asking and, and yes i already probably know the answer but we need to start asking why the hell those things aren't immediately available as an option mm-hmm. why because and i know why because big pharma owns yeah. the that and big pharma pulls the strings and puts the money in the pockets. And, you know, look, that the reality is, is that the reason why one bill already failed to make that available is because of that. And, you know, um, not enough questions are being asked about, okay, so what does the process really look like to have a new treatment become uh, funded and available? Because I think there's going to be a lot of dark secrets inside of that. Um, And um, but those are the questions we need to ask and push and push and push on, because things do actually can happen and and change can come about. But it takes so much public pressure uh, to make it happen, you know, and films one way. Yeah, films one way that that can that can help. But I mean, it's just one out of like 100 that need to happen. It takes public outcry or it takes people to threaten with with uh there's two ways to get government agencies to change is you threaten to humiliate them publicly or uh, they get humiliated publicly and have to make some adjustment or congress takes back the purse and pulls their money back if they don't behave so Mm -hmm. when you're talking about federal entities and now you got a federal entity uh, overseeing other federal entities. So there's this kind of like, uh, you know, like professional regards and things like that. And, and there are some things not being, I'm not a shill of the VA. Hmm. And, but I, like I say, I have no problem taking truth to power. Uh, I could probably, you know, I put my phone number in there. If any of you want to call me and, and, and tell me a story and I'll carry it all the way to the secretary. Mm, that's great. I would. Li- I would like to. Let me copy that down. 
It's in there. And Brian, you posted your number, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, because I, I, I've got something in the film that I know you've tried a lot of things, but if you're still willing to try something, I've got something that just, I've seen such tremendous success. I'd love to just share it with you. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. For sure. Send, uh, send me a text or something. Or okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just to speak to our experience with Frank, you know, like I was saying about how different, you know, West New York is from New York City. Um, you know, we didn't want to, this film to be an indictment of the VA or anything, but you know, we saw it along the way, like just, just there's nothing, like there's just no facilities. Frank broke a tooth, was he in, um, he was in Syracuse. I think he had a drive to Rochester, which was like, I think three hours, mm -hmm. um, only to wait like 10 hours to find oh out gosh. that they couldn't take him. And, you know, this is something that we were like, old. you know, this at the time we're like, this is obviously going to be in a movie. I mean, this is like exactly what's, you know, what's, what's going on. It's just, uh, you know, it's like, how do you tell that story? How do you, you know, and, and Frank's was a tooth. It's like, it's almost insignificant compared to like, you know, a lot of the counties Brian, thing. what you're doing through, but yeah, some of these counties don't have no representation. And right. Frank made a point to tell every, every, you know, representative he met, every Senator, Congressman, you know, and like you said, it's like the, that line between shaming or just, you know, trying to get them to be aware of the situation they maybe don't even know, you know? Well, I mean, like for me, for example, like, uh, you know, I'm not trying, it's not an indictment on the VA from my, my end of things either. Um, but it just, it, I think it, it, it's more of a, a sign of the deep-seated ignorance as to what PTS is. Yeah, it's a wake-up call. I mean, um, even if, if even the medical professionals at the VA don't have all the tools, like, actively necessary, ready to pull them out, you know, how is anybody else going to have, how can we expect anybody else to have a, a, uh, uh, you know, an opportunity or, or possibly have that in their toolkit, you know? And that was Frank's point was if they can't even fix my crack too, like how can they fix someone's mind? You know, mm -hmm. how can they kind of get into it and deep dive deep and understand what actually some, what someone needs to, mm -hmm. to get help? Yeah. You know, one thing too, uh, just to let you know, Doc Springer is wonderful. She wrote Warrior, How to Support Those Who Protect Us. She was on Michael Geyer's documentary, she is on the next segment at 6 p.m. Mm, good. She's fabulous, and, by the way. Yeah, she fabulous. is fabulous. And she's uh, she loves our warriors. And she uh, Jennifer Tracy is also somebody who helps people navigate uh, trauma. Um, she mm. works a lot with first responders. They are both on at 6 p.m., you know, in 10 minutes. Um, and I just... Yeah stick around, you know, maybe, maybe there's something in there too, that can help, you know, navigate some of the trauma. She can tell you more about the st Stella state. What is that? What Stella, is that called, Michael? Stella ganglion block. Stella ganglion Stella. block. That is. SGB. Been, yeah. That's, that's amazing to was for some people like crazy Vietnam veterans can all of a sudden are like better in one day. That one guy, I think on one of the, on uh, your documentary, Michael, um, but there's just some other modalities that they, that Michael explores and Shauna is, uh, Doc Springer is a big part of that. So anyway, um, you know, we, we are going to have to wrap this up, uh, cause we're going to have the next, uh, group coming on. Um, what a great conversation. Again, I just, I, I love your hearts to do this. All of you, it's like you, you get these civilians with big hearts to just do this labor of love. And I do really feel like the ripple effect is something we'll probably never even know, you mm. know? Um, and, um, and then we'll see it, but so much is going to be, uh, talked about and put out there. So, uh, does, does anybody have more thoughts, uh, before we wrap it up? Okay. Thank you. Thank you to all of them. Uh, I, would, I would just say really quick. Um, I heard about um, the SGB procedure uh, back in March, April. Uh, I was, I had a, for my, my fourth appeal for my VA disability um, rating, the psychiatrist, psychologist that I, I had my comp, my CNP exam with compensation and pension. It's like a psychological evaluation. Um, she suggested I check that out. And she said, oh, there's a 60 Minutes article on it, whatever. Something hey, Brian, I know those guys, just so you know. Like, um, in my backyard, I'm, I'm, I live near the Naval Academy. Um, oh. And uh, so a couple, uh, these, these two doctors that were 
part of that and everything, uh, Dr. Mulvaney and Dr. Lynch, they were um, combat medics themselves, you know, and so they come at it from a very unique angle, right? And they treat people outside of veterans, but, and they do, people come from all over the country to see them. But mm -hmm. check it out. Their website is actually called uh, Stellet Institute. Um, dot org or com. I'm not sure, but Stellet Institute. Um, uh, you, they're they're incredible guys. Yeah. So I, so I saw like so I was watching the 60 Minutes thing and a uh, uh, fellow Marine, uh, Medal of Honor recipient Dakota Meyer. Dakota. Yep. Yeah, man. He went there. He worked with those docs. Yeah. But so I mean, but so I saw that, and then um, I. I I, um, I think one of the other pe people that was interviewed, somebody went to like Long Beach or something, the Long Beach VA where they're doing it. And so I brought it up to my, my yeah. therapist at West LA, which is yep. literally like 20 miles from Long Beach. Right? Yeah. And uh, I'm like, hey, I heard about this. And they're just like, we have no idea what you're talking about. We, this is not a VA thing, blah, 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 blah. No, no, they they, they, they are doing it in the VA. Long Beach, right? Some VAs yeah. are doing it. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Yeah. <laughs> There's a, a, the places that I know, I, like in Chicago, San Francisco, Austin, and mm -hmm. out here where I live, those are places that I know have um, actual practices, um, but there's got to be more. Um, well, Shauna's going to be on Doc Springer, and they've got the Stella yeah. group all over the country, and they're opening up all over the world. Uh, one of the guys, Dr. Taravi, who was in my film with Dr. Lipov, who actually does he's the one who started yeah. selling him block yep dr lapaz in the film but dr travi he does it very inexpensively and he's very good at it and he just did the recent study that was just explosive because of all the positive results that they found in this recent study so there's a lot of options and availability yeah. including in certain va hospitals throughout the country certain there is momentum there is momentum for sure um yeah. i i yeah i'm praying like hell that like they're yeah just that hope is there that there's going to be a breakthrough where they realize like, look, there's too much info here for us not to back this and fund it. Exactly. Right? So. Yeah. I have a question for you guys. Um, a couple of people had mentioned to us and we were kind of been toying with the idea since the beginning, but just uh, about adding a sort of call to action to the end of our film. And, you know, it's not like there's so many groups and there's so many things and there's so many ways and, organizations and we don't want it to come across as being like you know you know an infomercial for frank's organization for this or that or right one over the other and i'm just curious what your take is on that because we do feel like we'd like to leave people with something you know a way to either continue on their own you know doing research on their own or you know just something to leave them with that's not just what we're giving them you know, or I, mean, I don't do I, I think if you feel that way do it because like we chose not to do that um but it's all about the purpose right like if you feel that like you can help continue to build bridges with Frank with yourself however do it uh you know like a John actually started a nonprofit and named it after go. the film um and that ended up being our kind of bridge right we promote that for him all the time and and so he takes guys out into the wilderness and on rugged hikes and and mm. you know so that's like their modality whatever you know but um do it man i would say yeah, if that's, that's funny you say that because we're the opposite walk with frank inc was his nonprofit for 30 years we found the name walk with frank so perfect it's, it's on the t-shirts the hats it just yeah philosophy. <laughs> like, we can't not call it the film that but we did go through that idea of like, we don't want it to be like promoting his, you know, thing, or should we, should we embrace the idea that we have this awesome nonprofit that's just Frank, it's really <laughs> just one guy, you know, it's not like he's got a team of people. Um, but it's like, you know, do you want, is that the call to action? Like, I'm, I was just curious what your guys take take as filmmakers is and working. I mean, you do see it in a lot of films. It's not, I mean, I think, you know, for us, we, you know, I think, um, I don't know if it was because we felt like it would be, it, it feels so narrative and cinematic that we didn't want to take people out of that moment. It might've been like a big part of it, but um, we also knew that we would be having uh, John talk about things right after a lot of cases, we would be doing a lot of Q and A's. We knew that we would make that part of our, you know, right? Like, um, but I mean, I don't, there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, if, if, you, if you're gonna drive engagement, it's all about engagement, right? Like, if you feel like you can help somebody, then. Sarah, I know you need us off soon, right? 
Yeah, um, but I, I just, yeah, I would, I mean, anything that helps. I, I, I never mind let on our call if any, if the people promote whatever they're doing, because it, it is a call to action. It is directing people to something that would resonate with them. Yeah. And, and you uh, don't know, you don't know what that's going to be like to Michael's. No. You don't know, like, I mean, you know, so I try to tell people about Bastards Road Project all the time because it, maybe it's one out of a hundred people that would re resonate and connect with, but I'll take one out of a hundred. Absolutely. That is yeah. definitely one. And um, um, I always just invite people to our coffee groups because that's the thing. That's where they get connected with other veterans, other first responders, and then they all help each other with what worked for them. So it's a very simple, then they, and they have friends too. <laughs> they yeah. make friends and they have people to do this journey. And then somebody hears something, or we have a guest speaker on, or, um, so I, I think all these things just help. Thanks yeah. for providing us for this, uh, the, yeah. the space for the conversation. Because and, and everyone here just yeah. really love your thoughts and questions. And it's really just been yeah. amazing to be a part of this group. I Thank really you. appreciate Yeah. Thank all you, of you. Uh, thank you so much. And if, if there's anything that we can do on our platform to support you guys, or you have any other thoughts, please always circle back. And so goes for us too with you guys, everyone there, you know, thank always you. Try to reach out. Uh, thank you.